Our guest for today, Emily Kark, grew up in rural Northeast Pennsylvania, where she still resides with her husband and two boys. She is an author and is the founder of Learning to Live Beloved Ministries, a nonprofit providing hope, healing, and restoration to women recovered from sex trafficking and trapped in sexual exploitation. Emily has always had a heart for women hurting around her, especially those trapped behind social barriers of shame and judgment. Since God broke her heart in 2022 for women trapped in human sex trafficking and exploitation, Emily began to see the vast need for housing and restorative care. Her dream in starting Learning to Live Beloved Ministries is to not only provide housing, meaning physical needs, but also to meet spiritual needs by bridging the gap between those around her who are broken and alone in the arms of the Savior who can heal every hurt and restore them to their fullest potential in Him, thereby gifting them the name God calls each of us, Beloved. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the Conscious Cup. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. So guys, Emily, we met through a mutual friend um, virtually, <laughs> but mm -hmm. she is the founder of Learning to Live Beloved Ministries. So I would love for you to just kick us off, Emily, and tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you got started. So about a little over a year ago, I was with some friends who have been fighting sex trafficking for a couple years now. They do awareness and I went on a ride along with them to another city. Just, you know, that'd be fun to get away for a day. And I ended up meeting a survivor of human sex trafficking and it mm -hmm. rocked my world where before I had been this wife and mom who kind of knew of things happening in the world, but really just wanted to plug my ears, stay mm -hmm. in my comfort zone, do my thing. And God was like, I have something so much more for you. At that time, I'd been really wrestling with the Lord. I was trying to pursue writing and speaking as a means to bless the women around me to offer them hope, to speak mm -hmm. truth and life to them. And I kind of had been fixated on that would be the only way I could reach women trapped in shame or the lies of the enemy. And that day when I met this survivor, God just really kind of blew up the map where I had been looking so laser focused on one way mm -hmm. to help the women around me. And he's like, I have a whole a whole other demographic that I want you to reach <laughs> with the words I'm giving you, with the things that mm -hmm. I'm teaching you. And so that's kind of where learning to live beloved ministries started and just grew from there as I started researching about trafficking mm -hmm. and what was the needs in our area. Wow. Wow. And can you tell everyone where you're based? What, what city? Yeah. So I am in Berwick, Pennsylvania. I'm in okay. Columbia County, Pennsylvania, and that's where our future safe house and organization will be built in Columbia County. Amazing. Amazing. And I know it's called the well house, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'd love you to talk a little bit more about the name. So learning to live beloved is a very unique name. Mm -hmm. And I think those who don't believe in God are probably curious right now. Okay. What is, where did you get that from? So it really came to me, honestly, before I had the, the ministry mission, it had come a couple months before that. And I had that name, Learning to Live Beloved. And I want to teach women how to live beloved in Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what it was. I'm like, God, mm -hmm. why did you give me this ministry sounding name? Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, but for many years, I struggled as the woman in shame, kind of ostracized mm -hmm. by the church, by religious people and, you know, a lot of fingers pointed for poor decisions I had made, but God was always so faithful in that to pull me out and draw me to him. And he mm -hmm. taught me and is still teaching me how to live by the name he calls each of us, which is beloved. We're his beloved children, mm -hmm. his beloved daughters for the, the females that are listening. And I so desperately wanted to share that with other people. And so it just fit when I knew God was like, it's a nonprofit. You got to start a nonprofit. You got to fight trafficking. You got to provide a place for these women to go. I knew that what we would want to teach them through the course of the ministry is how to live beloved. So our tagline is hope, heal, restore. Hope is the hand that we're extending to them in their dark, forgotten circumstances, as so many of us are. 
We then offer an opportunity to heal from the trauma they've endured, but not just heal. It doesn't stop there. Christ comes for full restoration. And so what we believe and we want in our programming as we we work towards that is that they get full restoration. They don't walk Mm -hmm. around with a limp the rest of their life. There may be a scar, but it's a scar that points to Jesus because he's fully restored that that wound and that that trauma in their lives. And they they walk away living beloved in him and sharing that with the world around them. So how the well house fits Mm -hmm. in is I kept thinking of the woman at the well and how she was, why was she there at noon? Why didn't she Mm -hmm. go with the other women? She went because she was ashamed and she was hiding as Mm -hmm. a lot of us are, even if you've not experienced a significant trauma, there's different shames we have in our life and Mm -hmm. we hide away. We hide from God. We isolate ourselves, but Mm -hmm. Jesus went and found the woman at the well. And so Mm -hmm. that's why we want to name it the well house, because we believe that this is a space where they can come. They don't have to be ashamed or maybe that demographic that would be meeting, (laughs) meeting alone and hiding away. This is a place you can come, but Jesus is there. It's Mm. not where all the judgment is. It's not where all the shame occurs. There's something different here, but it's a safe space. That well is a safe Mm. space for you to find that restoration and healing you so desire. That's beautiful. I mean, I'm, as you know, I'm a believer as well. So I very much resonate with what you're saying, but I think even for those who don't know God, don't believe in God, you know, or have had church hurt or poor experiences, Mm um, with, you know, the church in in their past, kind of like you're saying, uh, being ostracized or whatever Mm -hmm. experience they've had that's been negative. I think, you know, I just look at Jesus's life as he was the ultimate disruptor. And so it's really cool that he's called you into a space where you, you get to be a disruptor as well, but you're also a light bearer, you know, for Mm -hmm. these women. So I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know what I would do without my relationship with God, especially in this line of work, because it is very dark. But I think it's amazing that you're also very focused on aftercare, because as we know, there's so many different ways to kind of be a part of like serving in this area. Um, So I, yeah, I'd love to hear more about you went on the ride along um, and you came back and that just totally changed your life. So yeah. why aftercare? Like, why not rescue or, you know, like, what was it that you were like, okay, this is like what I feel called to do? Well, I kind of just came home very, very broken and mm. just praying. I spent probably a good week just like, why is this affecting me so deeply? There's tons of world issues that are being screamed about right now. Why won't this leave me? What about mm. this? And I felt the Lord just call me to this area, to my local counties and to the woman where there is not something already provided for them. We have domestic violence shelters. We have homeless shelters. We have some mental health things. We're in a kind of rural area, so it's we're pretty limited, but there's nothing for women coming out of trafficking and exploitation, nothing at all. And so initially I, as I asked questions, God just kind of opened the doors. He just he, this is him. Like I've not had to manipulate or push or force anything through this whole project. And that's how I know it's his because he just keeps blowing holes in walls. Like I just pick up the phone and make a phone call and like 10 doors open. And so as I researched, I realized we only have eight long-term restorative care facilities in Pennsylvania. They're all with at least two hours away from us with, you know, six beds. And if the need is so massive that they're already full and have waiting lists. So I wanted to do restorative care here. However, again, in more research, it came about that we do need that first tier one stop for the women, which would be like a four to six week stay. So that's what the well house will be with the intent that at some point we will grow for you know, they can stay with us for that long-term care, but yeah. they're really, there is nothing here except for one place in Pittsburgh that recently opened that does that short-term care, allowing them that time to come right in off the streets or wherever they right. find themselves. Um, so I don't know that we'll actually be doing the rescuing. We are working with law enforcement towards that goal. Yeah. Um, but that will, will kind of be like that first stop for them in their very long process of healing. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I think for people, I think a lot of people, at least with conversations I've had here, 
in the U.S. is like they can imagine in these bigger cities, L.A., Mm -hmm. New York, you know, and stuff that, okay, this is a problem. These are huge cities. But in where you live, how do you get people to care or to see that, hey, this is happening right in our small town? You know, these these people are being trafficked across state lines. And, you know, it's not just in these large cities. What would you say to those people? That is tough. And I get that question a lot. Um, Mm. I think even as I'm learning, I'm able to better educate other people. And so the biggest Mm. thing for our area, when even I ask law enforcement and people in government positions are like, oh, we don't have trafficking here. Like, we we don't know anything about that. I'm like, but I can see it. I can point it out. And I've only been investigating this for a year and I don't Mm. have this lengthy background and investigative whatever. But what really... The issue is, is that we've been asking the wrong questions. So when, mm-hmm. if I go back and ask those same questions, but put in the word prostitute, I get mm-hmm. different answers or right. child abuse. And so right. we weren't, we haven't asked the right things. We're not asking the right things. Mm-hmm. And so we're missing it when there's child abuse cases, when there's domestic violence, when there's prostitution, when there's something funky going on at the local strip club or massage parlor, we kind mm-hmm. of turn a blind eye because we don't have enough resources in the area mm-hmm. to address it. And so we just don't want to get into it. We're missing it. We're completely yeah. missing the face of what trafficking is even further mm-hmm. still, you know, we kind of think of trafficking is just going to look like a 36 year old woman locked in some basement. Well, mm. it could be that homeless person on the corner. It could be that yeah. person in, entering um, rehab mm. for mental or drug for the third or fourth time. And mm. again, we miss it because we're not asking the right questions and she might not even know she's being trafficked or exploited. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, I hope in all of this that I'm, I and my team are able to better educate, not just the community lay person, but Mm -hmm. the organizations as a whole, like what, what are we doing to screen for this? And I, Mm -hmm. I know kind of a common theme is that everyone is overworked and underpaid. And I understand that, Mm -hmm. but I hope that what we provide will be able to be that outlet and that resource that they can connect with. So that they can be educated and they know someone's there then to step in when they feel a little in over their head. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great explanation, by the way. Um, I feel like a lot of people are also like I hear it's like, oh, I want to be involved, but I don't know where to start. So Mm -hmm. for you, I mean, I think it's very inspiring just to hear your story of like, okay, I personally had this encounter and it just kind of changed everything for me. And I knew I had to do something. And that was sort of, I didn't have that first encounter, but I heard a speaker and I had a very similar, you know, experience in that I was like, okay, I have to do something, but I don't know where I fit in this yet. Like, what would you say to someone who's like, what is step one? You know, like, where do I begin? Because a lot of people also are like, I don't feel qualified or I'm not a social worker or I Mm -hmm. have to like have, you know, like some sort of qualification to be able to like talk to a survivor. And so I think Yes, I do think there needs to be some sort of like trauma training, you know, like things yeah. that happen in store, but it's not necessarily like you have to get a whole degree to like be right. in this, you know, involved in this. Right. Yeah. Because if we did, then I couldn't be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not Same. qualified <laughs> in any way. And you're inspiring Same. too. what you do with Social Brew. I think it's just amazing. And it proves that like, we all have a niche. We all mm-hmm. have gifts that God has given us mm-hmm. and press into those and ask him. That's really what I have done and continue to do is just pray, like pray like I never have before. Like, God, if this is from you and you want me to do it, then you open the door. And if not, I'm going to sit and be patient. And that's not something mm-hmm. I do easily. But I think, you know, if you're curious about it and you don't know what to do, then learn, learn for your area, ask the questions, mm-hmm. go talk to your local police force, go talk to your local victim advocate office, see what they know, look up the local centers around you, ask them what they're seeing. You know, if there already are some established places, see if you can volunteer. They always are looking for volunteers. If you're more of like, I don't know that I can get involved and you're able to donate, find a place to donate, you know, get, Mm -hmm. get involved even, you know, with social brew and what you do, because you are helping distribute funds where they need to go. So Mm -hmm. I think that's incredible, but I think a pray 
and then start asking questions and yeah. allow God to put you in the right spot for your giftings. Cause it's mm-hmm. going to look maybe different than me. It's going to look different than you and different than the next mm-hmm. person. But each part mm-hmm. is so important. We have friends that I went with, they really just hone in on education. And my friend is a nurse. And so she has started a whole program at our local hospital, which is a pretty big hospital, educating all the doctors and nurses on Mm -hmm. trafficking and how to identify trafficking. And it's just exploded. And, but that's her gift. God placed her at that hospital for a reason. And so you're never too small or it's never too little, like whatever God asks you to do, donate that money or step up and be that voice or volunteer at that shelter. They all intertwine so importantly for this Mm -hmm. and for someone, because you're a link in that chain that is necessary for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it just reminds me of my other nonprofit partner. That's how she got started as an ER Mm -hmm. nurse is just seeing these children come in and it wasn't, something wasn't adding up with their Mm -hmm. stories. So that's kind of what sparked it for her. So I think, yeah, you don't have to have some crazy like experience to do this too. I think it really can just be like, oh, I watched this documentary and now like I want to know more. And there's so many resources out there. Um, mm-hmm. I know I have on my website, but I can always share more on on social media and stuff of like mm-hmm. great resources. Like I know International Justice Mission is one too yeah. that does a lot of amazing work and they kind of encompass like labor trafficking, sex trafficking, yeah. all these different sides to it too. But yeah, I think the sex trafficking piece, there's Something, just anything where you feel like, okay, this person is being bought and sold and manipulated. Like if that doesn't grab your heart or like disturb you to a degree, like, I don't know, like it just is like, it's almost impossible. I think once someone like really lays it out for you to just kind of like go about your day, like, okay, cool, you know? And I always say that's why with my business, I'm like, you don't have to be on the front lines, but if you like right. coffee or pancakes, hey, you're then you're already contributing to something, yes. you know, yeah. really, really good. So, yeah, I would love to for you to you explained a little bit about your name, but could you explain the metaphor of the butterfly and how that aligns with your mission or your organization? So glad you asked this question because the logo is so important to me. It's so special. Mm-hmm my pastor actually very graciously donated the logo to us, donated his time in in putting it together. And we kind of sat down one afternoon and talked about the vision. And this was really early on and just kind of my heart for it and and wanting to make sure the logo was something that meant something. I didn't just want it to be Mm -hmm. another picture out there in the universe. And so he took all the things I said, and he came up with this beautiful logo of the butterfly. And so if if you look at it, half the butterfly looks like a butterfly and the other half is two tulips. So what my pastor had kind of said that day, and so I can't take credit for it, was that, you know, when we think of the butterfly and that kind of metamorphosis thing, that's not really where these women are or people coming out of trafficking. They're full grown adults. Like they've already come out of the cocoon. They're a butterfly that has been maimed and has a wing hanging off and dangling off. And so the two tulips represent like this new life in Christ. And so the tulip historically represents a deep and perfect love, which is Christ's perfect love for us, you know, the beloved and and living in his love for us. And the tulips are a hue of purple which represents royalty in our new life in Christ. So we were one thing and then we're another. And so now we're repaired and we're completely restored, but we're a brand new thing. And that scar, again, it's beautiful now, right? You have two beautiful tulips on one side of you and you're cohesive. So your story comes together and is something beautiful because Christ has touched it and healed it and restored it. And you're no longer, you know, limping around. So I I love the logo. I'm so, so pleased with it. That's so beautiful. I love that. I love that there's so much symbolism behind yeah. those names and everything. So that's amazing. And I know, so you're creating with the well house. That's mm-hmm. one side of things, but I would love for you to share more about angel packs and how you sure. partner with other nonprofits. Yeah. So very early on, as we were filing our nonprofit 
tax exempt status, all of that. Mm -hmm. There was another local nonprofit called Fierce Love for Good that I was able to meet. And they've been huge champions for us in that they've been friends, mentor, prayer partners. I'm so blessed to have them. And their focus is really that awareness and kind of that prayer support and support for organizations that are already established. And one way they do that is through angel packs. They're little blue bags that have a, a clean, new, still tags on, fresh pair of clothes, some toiletries, some food, water, a Bible, a devotional, a journal, just little things and necessities that are big things to someone who's coming out of exploitation or the industry. And we quickly created a bond and decided that my county needed to have a packing site. So I run a packing site here in a neighboring town. And so I get all the volunteers and we're not quite dependent yet. We still rely a little bit on Fierce Love for Good for our supplies, but we're getting there. We've already packed a little over 70 bags to go out to women who are coming out of sex trafficking. And we hope to get more established on our own. And then those bags will go to the women that we help in our area. So that's like the end goal of it. But that is one way that we give back to the community and it's already up and running, which is exciting. And it helps people feel like they can get involved because right now with learning to live beloved ministries, we're still trying to raise money for the well house to renovate it. So there's no true volunteer positions there unless someone can paint, which people have volunteered for, which is exciting. But having the angel pack is a, a tangible way people can get involved right now as we build the rest of the ministry by donating monetarily, donating supplies, having a supply drive, or coming and volunteering to pack. And I think it's neat too, because as that builds momentum and people do supply drives, even like my son's school did a supply drive, those people then get to hear about what trafficking is, hear that it's here, we're packing pack bags for here, and awareness is built that way, which I think is really, really cool how that mm -hmm. works. Yeah, and it's not quite as heavy or, yes. I guess, confronting for people, you yes. know, because you pack your kid's school lunch, maybe, and then you can do an angel pack with your yeah. kid and, like, you know, yeah. explain explain this and touch on it. Yep. So that's really cool. If people want to be involved in angel packs, is that something that happens across cities or is this just in Pennsylvania? I mean, if you go to fierceloveforgood.com, they have a way that you can donate there. I believe they also have like an Amazon wish list on there that you can have those things ship right to the founder of Fierce Love for Good. Great. If you wanted some things to come funnel down the line to us, just put like yeah. in a memo line somewhere that you want it to go to the Columbia County packing site. But either way, you are still serving good and it's all part of one big mission. So that is one way you can also, you know, look at my website and there's some information about angel packs there and you can contact me through there if you wanted to supply our particular packing site. But either way, mm. like it's, it's a good thing. So there's no competition. It's getting to the right place. I love that. I love that. And just to pivot a little bit, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into your personal journey and being sure. an entrepreneur <laughs> in the, in the nonprofit space. And, uh, what are some of the challenges you faced while trying to raise funding and build out this project for the well house? So funding is a major barrier. Again, we're in a very rural place and it's so intimidating to get online and, and network and sit down with people who've been in business for a very long time and be like, oh, I'm here and I'm going to take some of that money too. Mm. Like it's scary, but I also know that I serve a big God. And he told me very mm. early on, I'm going to supply all your needs, not just financial. I'm going to supply the knowledge that you need. I'm going to supply the energy that you need, the strength, the time. I'm going to, I'm going to multiply everything. So I know that me coming into this scene and on this stage does not mean that someone else is going to lack. God's going to multiply what's already there. So I try to remind myself of that. But funding, my lack of knowledge is super intimidating to me personally. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very much learning as I go and then just trying to bring that awareness. Because again, people are kind of like, oh, I don't know, like that it's here. And because I can't give them tangible numbers yet, yeah. um, that's a little hard too, because again, I'm working off people saying, we don't, we don't think it's here. And yet we live in a place where two interstates intersect and they can take you yeah. all the way across the United States, both ways. 
And, mm-hmm. and again, just as I've learned, I'm able to pick things out. No yeah. expert by any means, but I can definitely see things that aren't right. Yeah. Like I think the other week I saw four different women. I'm like, something is not right there. Yeah. And, but I can't take them as a tangible number. So just kind of yeah. bringing that awareness, like we're really grassroots starting at square one, trying mm-hmm. to get people to see it, to acknowledge it, to want to get on board with it. And just kind of trying to not live in imposter syndrome myself yeah. through all of that. Cause that is, I can really get down on myself a lot, but I was looking at my journal the other day and there was a couple of times that I specifically wrote down, I had meetings with people and they were so excited for me. And then I felt excited, like, oh, they approve of me. And God very quickly was like, you don't need their approval. I yeah. approved you. So that's, that's yeah. great. They feel that way, but I approved of you. So even if they don't, I put you here and I'm doing this. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that I definitely know what you mean. <laughs> I'm sure I definitely know. get that. Yeah. Imposter syndrome is real. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, you know, in the thick of that too, or it's just yeah. something that I feel like it's kind of a daily struggle, you know, mm-hmm. depending on what the day looks like and what your work looks like that day. But I think we all go through that to a degree and I just hope it it gets better as we continue in our, I just hope so. (laughs) But yeah, I think it's important. It's important to acknowledge both because I think it's really easy to see people doing really meaningful, impactful things and to just feel like, oh, well, I'm like not perfect or I haven't worked through this or that yet. Or, you know, like I have to have it all together to, to start. And that's the premise of this, this show is that you don't, you know, like you really don't, you don't have to be some perfect person that has all the answers, you know, like for you, you just said that, like, you felt firmly like God's just like, been the whole way through, like, I'm going to provide for all of your needs. And I felt that way too, with my business, like, funny enough, so many other things in life stress me out. But with my business, there's moments that it stresses me out. But overall, I just have such a peace that God will open the doors he wants to open and shut the ones he wants to shut. And I just have to be willing to keep walking. So I think that, yeah, just to encourage other people, just like keep, keep putting one foot in front of the other, even if it feels really difficult at times. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Oh, thank you so much for just sharing so much about what you're doing. I know you guys are kind of at the ground roots, but you've already done a lot. Um, You've laid a lot of groundwork. So if people want to get involved, and I know you said donate on your website Mm -hmm. and that kind of, that's one of the avenues, but what are some other ways that they could practically help? I mean, donate is a big one prayer. We need prayer. I feel like we can't get enough prayer. And then I just encourage the listeners to educate Mm -hmm. yourself. And that doesn't mean you have to become this person who travels and speaks about trafficking or what have you, Mm -hmm. but you should be aware for yourself, for your children, for your family, for your friends, because the more we know, the more we build that wall around our own community where traffickers are not going to want to come and exploit that area because if you know you're not a soft target so educate yourself you know you can go on polaris and the national trafficking hotline and read some things there you know you can look at your social media page my social media page look at some of the information there and just i think trying to encourage people to get rid of that stigma of what we think trafficking is what we think a prostitute is how we're judging those people so that our hearts can become tender and we're going to see things we didn't see before. And we're going to be used for good in our community instead of missing things that are there in plain sight. I love that. Yeah. In plain sight. That's another good documentary that I watched when I first, um, yeah, came to learn about this, but I also love on your site. One last thing I just want to commend you for is saying the practical side and the spiritual side combined. Like that was something I just reading through your website and talking to you before this is, I know a huge part of your vision and mission for your organization. And I think that's really important for people to know and to hear because it isn't enough really just to have the passion. Like that's where it starts, but you have to build out what is this, what is the most helpful for this community that I'm want to serve and I want to help. What are their needs? Um, And how can I, 
uh, be a part of serving those needs. And so I love that you're looking at it from both aspects. It's not an either or situation. So that's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And if people want to talk to you more or learn more uh, where can they go on social media or your website? So on our website, it's www.livebeloved.org. You can find me on Facebook at Learning to Live Beloved Ministries or on Instagram at Learning to Live Beloved. But both my socials are linked under the contact page. Perfect. Perfect. And I'll link it in our show notes so people, thank you. people know where to go. But thank you, Emily, and have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.